Hello. Uh, sorry about the slight delay there. Something went wrong. Um, G was uploading a few videos, and that caused this uh, this video to be not functional. It's yeah, it was not um whatever some computer magic. Anyway, it's fixed now. It's all good. G helped me sort that out. So yeah, here we are again for episode eight of Law and Draw, and we'll get right into it. So first thing I guess you might notice is I did get a haircut that was partially on purpose. So I just tried to give myself a little bit of trim by, you know, having it in the ponytail and then just cutting like this. But I ended up cutting it at about a 70 degree angle and it looked ridiculous. So uh, Georgie kind of helped me fix it and cut the rest of it off. So it's a lot shorter, but it's all right. Freaked all the students out for a little bit, but they got used to it eventually and uh, I'll get used to it eventually. But yeah, and it'll grow back. Um, yeah, on Mother's Day, yesterday, uh, whatever, today, I guess, for you guys, or well, most of you guys, looking through some old, well, mum always brings out some old albums, and then I saw pictures of myself with my hair at its longest, I'm like, oh yeah, it feels like a thousand years ago that it was like that, it was like a week. All right, but here we are, I know, if you're wondering about this picture, this is because I've been really into a tabletop game called Rumble Slam lately. It's kind of, if you've heard of Blood Bowl, like the fantasy football game by Games Workshop, it's kind of that, but for wrestling. So it's like all the, you know, usual fantasy races and a whole lot of stuff they've made up on their own, just a lot of really weird, crazy stuff. And they've got like very thinly veiled versions of real wrestlers as like different fantasy species and stuff like that. Like, for example, you know, John Cena's a chameleon for obvious reasons and stuff like that. Anyway, it's, it's really fun. I really love playing it, so it's been on my mind, so I thought, oh, here you go. So it's Kit and one of the rat uh, wrestlers, of which they're, that is my team, of course. But, you know, you got orcs, you got humans, halflings, dark elves, just any kind of monster and a lot of weird stuff they've made up themselves. So if you play tabletop games, check it out. It's really cool. Anyway, so yes, here we are. I a little while since I've done a stream, so I thought I'd do another one. Just checking that. Whoa, chat's happened. Okay, it's a little thing blocking that off. Close that up. <clears throat> Howdy, hi, hi. Oh, yeah, so um, we had a little fiddle around to try to fix the sound thing coming out of just one side of one headphone. And we've sort of figured out what it is, but we'll have to, you know, sort it uh, completely. Nice. Uh, let's see now. Mordak finished the Berserk Fury since the last stream, so glad I got that done. Yeah, the Kotobukiya Zoid masterpieces are pretty crazy. I actually think the Berserk Fury was one of the more fun ones. It is one of those ones where it's like, oh, as you're doing it, I just got to get it finished, but then it is finished. It's like, oh, that's finished, I guess. No. So you don't know whether the process is the thing you're paying for or just having a pretty cool model, but yeah, Berserk Fury is good. As I said last time, at least it's not the... Genosora, which was like the worst thing I've ever put together. And the worst thing to touch, because as soon as you look at it, it'll fall to pieces again. Uh, oh, what was a disaster? I don't know, but um, I know what a disaster was. It was also the Blade Lager Masterpiece Kit was a disaster, and that also will fall to pieces at the drop of a hat. Uh, okay, from uh, Omega, first question, ever think about doing the Americas streams every two weeks and doing the Europe ones every other week? Um, yeah, well, I put it to the European folks like a couple of times, but I don't think, yeah, I mean, unless they kind of want me to do it, I don't really, you know, there's not really much of a thing in the last few times I haven't really had a response. So I'll probably just leave, uh, probably won't do European ones unless, unless they kind of request it. But yeah, every two weeks, maybe. Depends how um, how my energy's going, how much I've got on. Which yeah, I could probably do that. Probably not, yeah, probably not more often than that. Um, Here's first question, first request for the week. Uh, nervous, you know, nervous stare at each other. Uh, seem a bit weirded out and confused. Yeah, I'd have to remember the difference between them because they look pretty similar. Might just be like a mirror image. Sounds good tonight. Good, 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 good. Well, as good as it can sound in this room that seems to be designed to be the opposite of good acoustics. I don't know. I think just miniatures have the opposite of effect to, like, foam stuff on the walls where they'll just make it sound as tinny as absolutely possible. But, you know, baby steps. We'll get something, something good happening. 
hopefully it is at least coming out of two ears but yeah don't tell me if it's not because that'll be depressing sounds working on both sides okay i just read that so coming back to me reading the chat before i make wild claims good um auto sounds awesome well don't know about that but at least it's probably listen to a ball a joy on the gino yeah oh rip um Oh, except my name Ferry and had letter and eater here. Okay, it'd be Anubis difference. Yep. Uh, did some writing earlier, says Mordak. Hope to get chapter two done and proofread soon. Then I want to revisit chapter one and review a part of it. Hopefully after that, I'll submit all that and the art to Dio. So this is your kind of fan works based on um, In Our Shadow kind of post -mar uh, Marvel getting kidnapped or like the time in between, I think. Yeah, writing's like 10% doing the entire thing and like 90 percent editing it and changing things around glass glass everywhere oh yes the acoustics yeah that's a lot of glass also a bad thing to have in a room full of thousands of miniatures uh where the sun can get at them prepare for a lot of notifications when that happens oh yes i shall oh one other thing i will mention is um i don't know you probably guys know of uh kiwan or i can't remember uh, exactly how to pronounce his name but Deridel, who's also like a guy who is in Chile, who does basically the same thing I do, which is like anthros and mechs and stuff and a lot of bright colors. And they contact, contacted me recently. So we've been talking on Discord and we're just going to do a little collab. So um, I'm having them draw one of my characters and I'm going to draw one of theirs. So yeah, I just thought I'd mention that since you probably know both of us and I've been aware of them for a while. I know they basically do the exact same thing I do, a lot of comics, Patreon stuff, things like that. So yeah, prepare for a little crossover at some point. All right, so yeah, there's the Anubis ones and I've got a million questions from Mordak, which is good. So let's head back into there and see what's going on. Oh yeah, I finally looked up the... Um... <laughs> The Mouchley meme, which I didn't really know about. I mean, G had shown me a little bit out of context, but I didn't make the connection, the Resident Evil, uh, Ashley Graham connection. So I might give that one a go at some point. Um, but I don't know if I could even draw as cute as that is, so maybe I won't. All right, so some questions and some some stuff. So, yeah, so what I said, in reverse order questions this time. So the dumb, fun ones first, because we never get to them. Firstly, if Shaw played an MMO, what race and class role would he play if he had any option? So we'll do that one. Um, so I think the first thing I'll draw is also, I'll, I'll get to the Anubis one in a second, but I just wanted to do this one uh, from, from what I showed me a picture of a raccoon riding a boar uh, fighting a possum. I thought that's pretty relevant to what's happening about 20 pages ago in the comics. So maybe I'll do that one real quick, because that sounds pretty fun. A new raccoon secret weapon. So let's go up here, let's turn this off. What would Shoal be if he played MMO, what race, class, whatever? Oh, uh, let's see. So, uh, what's his deal? He's... I guess he... Probably should have thought about this for more than a second. But I guess he just likes, you know, control. So he'd be maybe like a support on a class of some sort. It's kind of smart, so I guess he'd like try to be like a wizard kind of kind of thing. Like he's sort of like I don't know, fairly aloof and and um probably has a lot of the the rage the sort of the, the characteristics of like, you know, a spellcaster. He'd probably spellcaster. A spellcaster, maybe more like a sorcerer, he'd probably be something like, since he'd probably edge towards you know, like evil, obviously. Um, and race-wise, I guess if we're just going, like, standard D&D-type races, uh, let's see. Yeah, something that, like, I don't know, there's this, the thing, though, it's, like, the thing that he's the most like or the thing that he would play as. So he's probably the most like something like a, an elf or an Aladrin elf or something like that. It's, like, lives forever, has, you know, a lot of weird abilities that other people can't do. I guess just like elves, he doesn't have to sleep, he doesn't have to do any of that stuff. So that's what he's probably most like, but in terms of, I guess, what he'd want to play as, I don't know. Let's see. Um, and I guess he would know a lot about that because he was the one who, you know, gave Amethyst the drive of human stuff, movies and other media. So I suppose he'd know about all that kind of stuff. So what would he be? 
Uh, he'd probably be like a drow or something. I reckon. Like a drow sorcerer. Sounds about sounds about right. All right, that was quick. The other one is uh the other silly question was hmm, do bears make and sell cocaine? So yeah, I wonder why that was axed. Well, yeah, so cocaine bear. I haven't seen it, but I do the thing where in order to keep up with all my social conversations, I'll just read video essays on all these movies that I haven't got time to actually watch myself. So I've listened to a lot of stuff. Your red letter media, your oh in Australia we've got a, a really cool kind of movie comic book podcast called The Weekly Planet, which I would recommend. It's very Australian, very cool. And they talk about all like, you know, stuff that's coming out. So I've become aware of Cocaine Bear and everything and the, the main gist of the plot and people's disappointment with just certain parts of it. And um, yeah, it looks, looks like a bit of fun, but not as much fun as people were expecting. So the bears kind of problematically in, in our shadow are kind of like a, like a Russian analogy, which I did start doing before the whole, you know, situation kind of happened. Um, which it just ended up like paralleling it nearly exactly, which is really crazy of them kind of going in and trying to take over sort of the like Northern Asia area, but then they all got wiped out by storm like nearly immediately. Uh, so they, yeah, I guess I don't want, like they kind of dropped them off pretty quickly because I was like, well, this is a little bit on the nose having the, 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 the bear sort of race be basically Russia and invading neighboring countries. But yeah, that's why they kind of vanished. But I bring that up only to say that in terms of like what the bears are like, I guess their mentality is kind of similar to that kind of typical, I don't know, Putin-esque sort of thing. And you know, the, and all the underworld stuff, the kind of whatever. So they definitely have a lot of alcohol and i suppose drugs is not completely synonymous but i'm sure I'm sure they dabble i guess like the bigger question is does cocaine still exist and probably yes uh let's say yeah it does it's probably a lot of that especially since after the world kind of went went to hell maybe like in the rat um kind of domains in the past there wouldn't have been much of that since everything was very kind of prescribed and there wasn't a lot of like freedom of like new technology being made. Everything was kind of just based on what Shaw ended up getting from the neural flare. And I suppose there would have been some instructions on how to uh, make some illicit substances in there. But of course, he didn't get everything. Let me just look up four for a second. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So he, he, yeah, because of the way he was flared in incompletely he probably didn't get much knowledge except for kind of bits that were his particular type of brain was designed to take so yeah he probably didn't and so there wouldn't be any in the rat stuff but they probably rediscovered stuff like that at some point oh i've done a very bad angle on this so i have to try to find let's see uh, do i want to type in boar from the back Mm, all right. I mean, you're not going to see much of it, but okay. <clears throat> yeah, so this is just a picture of a yeah, a raccoon riding a boar and a, a possum in kind of the in in the distance in someone's backyard, kind of looking thing. So let's see. I guess something about that size. Grab none of this under this fur here. I mean, that's the most beadiest beadiest of eyes. And this, yeah, that's essentially it, I guess. Okay, so then without worrying, you see like five millimeters of it. Yeah, and then a possum, I guess, even though it'd make more sense to be a squirrel, but um, there we go. I've seen so many of these in real life, which is why I'm so good at drawing them. And then it's like a like a different rat, I think, aren't they? Something. Um, it's very different from our possums, which are much more like um, our possums have a much like squishier face and uh, kind of like they yeah they're like a our possums are more like a really 
fuzzy bat squirrel kind of thing. And they've got big fluffy tails as well. Um, very different to the Ameri to the American ones. We have all this stuff. And I'm not sure why they have been called that. I guess someone must have made some weird parallel at some point. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so this is a, maybe this happened like a bit more in the past when they hadn't really like developed their technology quite so much. Actually, the only possum in it is Formaline. She doesn't really um, reflect the, their typical ideals. So let's just, I guess, just while we're at it, just make up something for their kind of combat sort of look. There was one in one of the last pages of In Our Shadow, but, oh, the first book, but I can't remember what they looked like, so. Um, yeah, this is more primitive, so let's go like a pitch, pitchfork. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's something. And then throw it snorting, so have a little snort. And oh yeah, I think that was like a I can't remember. I just dig into my whatever memory. I think that was like a clothes line or like a one of those um wing sets or something in the background of the picture. So that that can be that. It's at night time, so there, that's uh, something, 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 something to fast. All right, cool. Let's uh, head back into chat real quick. Oh, I've got so many tabs. All right. Oh my God. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so, uh, Mega says, speaking of which, I need to do some art and comics too. Hey, thinking of doing one with one of my OCs featuring a couple of yours via, if you're okay with it. Of course I'm okay with that. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, Heil. Mage. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, never give out the cocaine. That's basically overclocking and supercharging a supercomputer. Yeah, would cocaine even do anything to him since he's a robot? Kind of. Uh, mostly got skunks in my area. Uh, saw tooth biting just outside my apartment. That sounds like nobody wins that fight. A possum in part one iOS reminded me of a Moss Eisley bounty hunter scum or resident. Yeah, they had like a bandolier and kind of bits of pieces all over them. All right, so I guess I'll just do that Anubis one real quick. So we'll turn that one off and then put in another one. And I'll get another question from the list. So uh, with the word constant war, do they now favor military time or still use standard? I don't know if I ever specified what kind of time they even use. Mm, they it probably would be I guess it, it makes more sense for it to be like military time it probably just would have always used that but it depends kind of how they started you know monitoring time and all that kind of thing these are some very bad lines fix this up I'm jittery for some reason don't know why uh okay so let's go big pointy face that is how they go. Actually, it's kind of reminds me more like how I drew him in the in the the real terrible um, crossovers comic that I have, where it, they're more kind of closely based on the on you know the the hieroglyphic versions of of the Egyptian gods. Not that I would recommend anyone looking that at that, but I did put it up on Patreon just because. And I'm going to get some more sort of. Bitbox Apocrypha, old stuff coming up, like even older stuff kind of soon. I found some really old bits and pieces, so like from stuff when I was in what y'all would call elementary school, when I was in primary school, kind of grade, grade four and five and stuff like that, I found this old comic that I did, which I'll put up and, oh yeah, I think I might have mentioned one time in the past, there was a, a New Zealand comic that I used to read when I was in primary school by a guy called Murray Ball, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, uh, which was set on like a New Zealand farm about like a like a sheepdog and like his owner. And it was kind of like slice of life on a farm, very, you know, Australian slash New Zealand kind of humor from the from the 80s and 70s and kind of into the early 90s. 
by which I mean very not very funny. But I don't know, as a kid, you don't really have a good idea of what comedy is and everything's like as equally funny or as equally serious as anything else, which is why every kid I know, including myself, who watched Ghostbusters as a little kid, didn't realize it was a comedy and was just terrified by it. So anyway, um, Put Her Up Lats was the, the name of the comic. And I really loved it, even though, you know, it wasn't really that funny. You know, it might have been at the time before sensibilities kind of changed. Australian sense of humor is kind of weird anyway. But yeah, I really loved the art style and the like the setting and the characters and stuff. So I did my own little comic sort of based on it. But it was kind of like if an AI like was fed, you know, the Murray Ball comic strips and then told to make its own. It was kind of like that. I guess there's not much different between an AI and like a 11 year old kid. You just like absorb information and kind of like make a, make your own stuff based on it, but you don't really have any actual agency of your own. So you think you're making something good, but you're basically just like basing it on something without any idea. So it was sort of like, I think I thought it might have been funny at the time, but it was just very cringy and weird. So I'll put those up. It was actually a weird sort of crossover with, um, okay, so, uh, not as, just one moment, pull out a reference for my own character because I'm a professional. Look up a picture of, oh yeah, hardcover of this, which I did, oh, Industrial Revelations, which I don't know why I did, I did hardcover, I think I just, for some reason, decided to do that. The only one I ever did that for. Uh, let's flip through here for some probably terrible audio for a second until I find a picture of my Anubis and remember what he looked like. Too many damn characters. I mean, too many darn characters. We'll go through here. Boop, 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 boop. When did he... It mustn't have been a very long bit that he was in. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Oh God. I should have just gone for like just Kitbox hair default number three and that would have been pretty much right. Long forward and spiky. Oh, this is back when I did eyes very, very angularly, but I'll just modernize him a little bit. So yeah, he's kind of like this sort of thing. And then sort of down like that. And then still has these side bits because you have to. <clears throat> and still go down the back because you have to. And then, yeah, he's got this kind of thing going on because all of my gods have that pretty much. Well, a lot of them do. Oh, it's all like a throwback to, to like that first comic I did, I guess. Uh, yeah. So if I go back into there, I've forgotten what the rest of the thing was. <clears throat> uh, did it scroll back up? Um, stare at each other, they see each other for the first time, they seem a bit weirded out and confused. Yeah, okay, basically what it is already, I guess. Oh no. Doing something weird for a second. They're weirded out and confused. He generally would wear, but well, I guess they both kind of wear suits, so I guess that would be another weirder thing. Nah, uh, a little bit longer on the hair actually back here. <clears throat> anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yes, the old, the old stuff. So there's those old comments from like a million years ago, which I'll put up soon. And actually, speaking of writing, I've been doing a little bit of that myself. I've been, um, I had a little bit of, little bit of time, so I started to actually write another novel. I did do the Nicole's Ark novel, which in hindsight, I didn't really like how that came out, so which is why I never kind of bothered finishing it or putting it up, but it just, yeah, I don't know, it was, it was all right, but it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't, it wasn't what, it wasn't, I didn't want to put it out, I didn't feel like it represented my writing style very well or something but it is finished and maybe one day i'll come back to it and completely rewrite it but what i was writing recently was actually a 
might have mentioned this, can't remember. A um a new latest version of kind of the original story that I did back when I was in, I guess, early high school, grade grade eight, which was what everything else kind of stemmed from, all the sort of Android stuff and mecha stuff. So yeah, I was rewriting that. So I've written it as a like a YA sort of novel and shown it to a few people and they've been pretty, pretty, pretty uh you know, no, oh, I don't want to say impressed, but I didn't hate it, so that's good. And I think, yeah, again, it was because I was mainly looking at re. I was reading, reading, the, listening to the audio books of the Wings of Fire to E.T. Sutherland books, and I was like, yeah, I reckon I got inspired to write kind of like that. And I'm also rereading some of the Terry Brooks books, so it's kind of like a combination of that sort of fantasy stuff with a more modern YA slant in terms of how it's written being fairly like punchy and quick and a lot of a lot of a lot more character stuff rather than kind of event stuff so yeah that's been a lot of fun to do and it's kind of in it's the first book is nearly done I thought it was done but then you come back to it and change a million things around and eventually it never gets done you've got to release it but I yeah there's that and I'm actually going to release, not release it, I'm going to chat to some people about it because I've been invited to an event called Story Geek to talk in relation to using Dungeons and Dragons in classrooms as a storytelling tool. I got in contact by the director of TAS Writers, the Tasmanian Writing Association, and they wanted me to, to talk about that. So while I'm doing that, at the story gig thing, I might find an opportunity to talk to someone about my story as well. But yeah, that was, that was a nice little thing to have happen. So on the 27th of, no, the 25th of May, I'm going to be there, invited by the mayor of Hobart to, yeah, to, to, to talk about that. Because that's something I do at school. It's like the only subject I actually don't hate. So that is going to be something. That was a big... Big old ramble. So yeah, looking at each other and a little confused about about that since they are pretty much the same person. Yeah. Okay, new question. Um, how much did gravity increase with that virus to Shaw's gravity pack? Um, quite a lot. I'll probably would have like well, he sort of, his hands are sort of going through the floor with the force of it. So he probably, I don't know, many times Earth's uh, normal gravity. He probably would have become like 200 kilos or something or more, kind of forcing down and he's only three feet tall. But he managed to, you know, that, that was a, I, in hindsight, that whole scene was a bit too anime. I probably should have toned it down a little bit. But yeah, it broke out of his armor, became super fast, da 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 da. Um, okay, let's get another drawing suggestion. I'll just go from the list. Um, Brianna incorrectly telling Arthur about human culture with Arthur trying to contain his laughter. Yeah, I haven't drawn Brianna for a while, so maybe I'll do that. And questions. Uh, what was Tomaline about to say regarding anti-gravity tech and striders on page 71? Um, I, off the top of my head, don't know what page 71 had on it. Let me just have a real quick look back over here. Back to my gallery. Page 71. Mm -hmm. Let's see, find a picture that actually has tourmaline on it. A good start. Okay, that's 76. So, 75, 74, 73, Um, oh right, yeah. Anti-gravity technology is incredibly power intensive. That's why we no longer use, oh, she was just gonna say that's why we no longer use striders and things like that and power suits and anything. Well, they still use their actual power suits some occasionally when they need to, but yeah, it wasn't much more than that. I just, I think I just cut it off because, yeah, it was kind of thought fairly obvious what she was going to say, and otherwise the text would take up too much on the page. 
So she was just saying that's why we don't use striders and stuff. Uh, give any thought what mercenaries were paid during the empire? Did societies in part two have their own currencies depending on where they live? Um, no, I unfortunately immediately forgot about that. But um, there probably definitely would be currency now because there isn't like that one big kind of autocracy providing for the people. So there needs to be some kind of at least trade or whatever. And since the humans are back, they probably gave some ideas either on purpose or just vicariously of how to run a society in terms of having money and more than trade and things like that. Um, what was it? Oh, yes. All right. Brianna explaining something about human culture. Let's see. Man, she'd be really small compared to Arthur. Yes, Arthur. I'll figure that out. Is a thing I'd normally do with comic panels where they're sort of both at head height, but you can't see the rest of their bodies, so you, you don't have to worry about how they actually would need to be positioned in order to have that work. So back facing ears, big round eyes, and sort of like a like fairly smug expression, so maybe like um mm -hmm. Oh, uh, maybe actually, maybe like more like this kind of thing. Yeah, that feels about right. Okay, so yeah, they probably don't have hmm, coins and things like that, but something, something equivalent, something that would be readily available, kind of like I guess in Fallout, things like that with these bottle caps or whatever. They probably use something that was around. They probably use little pieces of the Twilight Shroud, but that's sort of everywhere. And uh, it's a resource that is, you know, not infinite, but it's kind of enough that you could probably base an economy around it. And not everywhere has them. And even though the, the Twilight Shroud fragments are on a lot of buildings and things, it would be pretty difficult to go off and try to, like, get them off there. So... Yeah, they probably, even though they're also around being used for something, they'd probably be like a currency that most races would, you know, find useful as a trade, a bargaining thing. And they would have like, you know, an inherent value that most people could decide upon. I guess kind of like, you know, fuel cells and things like that. So they're probably pretty, pretty well guarded. Yeah, so I reckon they would use the Twilight Shroud fragments in most places, which is probably why the, um, the raccoon civilization is is pretty poor and, and lacks resources because they haven't got any of that. They were in a place where the Twilight Shroud fell down and there wasn't like a pile on right there, so they didn't really have the opportunity to go out and get it when everything sort of went went to hell. So they were sort of on the back foot right from the start. Uh, uh, it's probably a bit better. Been watching. The, the Game Grumps Let's Play of Sonic Frontiers, so I accidentally started to draw Knuckles' hair, which is not too dissimilar to kind of how Brianna's hair is, but see if I can fix that a little bit so it wasn't so Knuckles-esque. Something like that, maybe. Yeah, all right. So yeah, probably Twilight Shadow Fragments is what they use. <clears throat> um, Da, 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 da. Where are the pilot typically located in most Soul Age striders? Mostly in the body, the like the, the the sort of being in the head is a very striderish thing that kind of is brought about later on. And that's because of limitations in the the feedback or the, the latency between the pilot and the machine. So because the like the strider that Shawl built, like later on aren't as advanced as the earlier ones, you kind of got to be like right next to the sort of the, the control center or the, um, the, because you're, you are basically, you know, feeding your own sensory and synapse information into the machine. So if you're in the head and it's coming from your head, then it's like less, less latency in how the reaction works. But in the more advanced ones, you can be a bit further away from the, like the sensory inputs and all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't really have much of an effect and it's a lot safer to be in the body and there's more room and all that kind of stuff so the more advanced it is the more likely that they'll be in the body 
So the kangaroo pilots are in the body, human ones are in the body. Anything more advanced than like shawl technology is probably going to be in the body. And even the the first ones he built, which he wasn't able to replicate after he lost a lot of his knowledge, those were piloted in the body as well. The, the ones that A Light and Clover ended up using. So yeah, and uh, anything else that would be of similar kind of technological advancement would be in the body too. Um, is there any purpose to the color of the soul gems and glowy bits, or is that just aesthetic choice? No, it's kind of both. The, like, the obvious, I guess, storytelling reason for why they're different is it's like a, it's a very basic, just a visual cue of, like, who's who and, and what's going on, especially in the early pages of the comic that was important because the only thing that existed were the rat striders. So whenever, say, Brianna took one over or something like that, his eyes would change color so that you could sort of tell pretty easily who's piloting what. But the, the other reason, I guess, the in-story reason for that is that it's all sort of linked. Oh, I guess the other sort of narrative reason is that, as I've said before, every race has its own color that it's sort of associated with, and that'll that'll generally like cross over to their soul gems as well. So that is sort of a bit like half and half, sort of narrative and and you know for the purposes of the audience. But the yeah, they don't really have any specific re um, reasoning except that. It's, I guess it's a little bit like Power Rangers, which I'm also playing the RP of still, where you've sort of got a, like a part of the spectrum associated with like your character kind of thing. And so each race is a little bit different in the way they think and the way they act, like their ideals and all that kind of stuff. So it's probably, um, yeah, so that'll reflect in like the different gems, colors, just kind of based on that, which is broadly speaking, not all kangaroos are the same and not all whatever's are the same. But yeah, that's that's kind of why that is. But there's no difference in they're not like Star Wars where oh blue crystal means war, kyber crystals and the purple ones is something something. It's like it doesn't really mean anything like that. It's just you know more of a more of a visual thing as it was in Star Wars originally, I guess, before the prequels came and had to explain everything. So yeah, no more reason. They're not different power levels or anything. They're just all the same. The, 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 the power level comes from how many of them you're able to have. And the amount that you're able to have is based on how advanced uh, your computer system is that you can control them. So in like a, a recent page of the comic, uh, Breeze Hurricane, the, the kangaroo character has got three of them because well, she's piloting or she's sort of controlling a very powerful, very big and sort of more advanced version of the the shields that the kangaroo striders have and because the the big defense shield thing has a lot more room for its computing power and Bray was able to um, you know rebuild that based on stuff that he still knew it's a lot bigger so it can be you know it, it can control three gems at once or nine gems because there's three people who actually run it but that'll be we'll more on that later on um did Final Version have a centralized server, or was it multiple servers spread throughout the world that connected to one another? It was, I'd say like it's just was one big server, just connecting everything together, just because everyone still wanted to be connected. So it's kind of like, I guess, internet style, where, yeah, it's, it's like a, a made up world. It's sort of both, because each individual like creature had their own thing that they wanted to like pursue well yeah, sorry creature each human had their own you know world that they wanted to create and live in and do stuff and probably most people who inhabited their own worlds were made up you know ai kind of things designed to be kind of exactly what they wanted to interact with based on exactly the the knowledge that they got from their use of the neural flare but they could you know talk to each other and they could talk to everyone pretty easily across the whole planet but they probably didn't do that very often. But there certainly was the was the option for that. Um, did flared humans ever figure out how to teleport or walk through time and space? So there's two things that I hate in science fiction, and those is them. I hate time travel and I hate teleporting, because I think both of them don't make any sense. Well, they sort of do, but they raise so many questions that it's just ridiculous to even try to 
unless you're using it as a very specific narrative reason and the the science of it doesn't really matter and you can like hand wave it away and that's acceptable because the story needs it then i just i, I don't know it's just silly i like the you know the idea of it it gives you a lot of things to do and i've been also re-watching the original series of star trek and they use time travel pretty well in that to explore some ideas while also not caring too much about time about how time travel actually works it's like oh an alien did it whatever don't worry about it um so yeah used in that way i like it but i like to ground stuff more in like very specific scientific stuff so i i don't think at, at no point in their advancement would humans have been able to you know uh sort of sort time travel out and teleportation out in a way that would be like ethically sound and make sense because teleportation no matter how you slice it you're basically recreating a version of yourself and you know what's to say you know oh you send your information through even your atoms through what's to say you can't use that information just to make infinite versions of yourself and then which one of those is you and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't know. It, it's not really a viable form of travel without raising like ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of conundrums that would just make it, unless you would need to do it as an emergency and you'd know you're actually, even if you are sending a matter stream across the universe, you're still rebuilding yourself atom by atom into something that's essentially different and you could make another version of yourself as well. So I don't know, you do it more of as a, as a last resort, self-defense, need to get information to something rather than, you know, doing it on a daily basis. Probably not. Uh, let's see. So let's, I'll think about what she's actually describing in a bit, but let's get Arthur in here. I suppose it'd be like a little table. And yes, her very um, ill-informed or her like a lack of paying attention to what Amethyst was t talking to her about you know how human stuff works or what it actually is meant that uh, yeah and it, she does the thing where she knows more than anyone else even if it's not exactly right she knows more about things than anyone else in the room so she'll just like with great confidence talk about what she thinks she knows about human stuff and what it's called no one else can really contradict it but probably neither did they actually really care so either way, she can be like smug and whatever, and then no one else eh, is any of the wiser. But as soon as they come across someone, say Arthur or Amethyst, who actually does know, it becomes pretty obvious she's like got a lot of things pretty wrong. So yeah, let's see. If anyone wanted to suggest like a piece of technology that it could be that she's like trying to explain to him what it is. You can just chuck that in the chat and I'll uh, use that one. Oh, he's got a bit more hair. Sorry, I've been drawing shawl a little bit lately and um, he has very less hair than that. Let's go. And uh, hmm. kinda, let's see, it's kind of like and not to, yeah, there we go. That's a very goofy, but that's a not, that's a try not to laugh. God, you look at me in her face. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, So let's see. Another question while we're at it. Um, yeah, um, so, oh yeah, I guess a little bit more on time and space. Like, yes, you can, in, in a lot of my comic things, you can slow time down, you can speed it up, you can um, do that, you know, using relativity to, you know, speed an object up, slow its time down, use gravity to warp space to, you know, make the process happen more. So you can sort of, I guess, go into the future, but not really, and you can't go into the past and um, yeah, you can sort of make predictions of the future based on you know mathematical probabilities of things that happen. And actually, the little novel I, I wrote is a lot about that. But it's yeah, you like there's no real way to like affect change in the past really. Go back in time and do that. So even even with all their knowledge, like maybe if you were like a fourth dimensional being that could see all of time and space at once, which I think is something that you can do. 
if you had the you know the ability to actually perceive it you're like just like you know a two-dimensional creature would be able to perceive three dimensions in the way that they're passing through infinite two-dimensional spaces through time so at the end of their life they see like a segment of three-dimensional space or three-dimensional stuff you could probably perceive if a creature that could perceive the fourth dimension would basically be able to be seeing the entire time stream all at once and could effectively like look at time as as a big thing it probably wouldn't help them too much even if they could do that so yeah but even even flared humans wouldn't have that ability so they probably yeah no time travel no teleportation or maybe teleportation but not just to move around willy-nilly at the top of a hat uh yeah so let's see go back over here it's been a little while since i've been in chat so i'll have a little a little look Uh, 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 <clears throat> oh goodness <laughs> okay uh wolf helping oh another drawing suggestion wolf helping out the lemurs preparing for the coming storm mm -hmm. oh yeah but my notebook wolf helping Lemurs coming storm. The X Men, I assume you're talking about. Uh, Nimbus looking fabulous, of course, always. Another request. Uh, Nervous and Rumor meet Johan. Johan introduces himself and tells them something important. Nervous Rumor Johan something important it <laughs> mistakes him for star fox which he yes nervous looks quite a lot like him as i mentioned last time um thinking for next month's patreon commission will probably be arthur wondering that corrupted and broken remains a final version funny enough i think of lovecraft mailer city the final version i don't I haven't read any Lovecraft stuff in a while. The only city I remember in that was the one where there was like that the house you could never get to, even though you could see it from everywhere, you could never actually reach it. So I'll have to look that up. But yeah, that sounds good. Uh, why I put down the page number? Yep, thank you very much. Just planning to call currency credits for now in the story. Yeah, yeah, sure. You can't go wrong with calling something credits. Sitting down, yeah. Uh, yeah, good corrective. This is funny. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, oh, yes, AC Pilot. Two choices for a request. Brianna and, Ameth Brianna and Amethyst getting married with Amethyst carrying a number at wife. Um, or you could draw one of your characters by letting your favorite infinity tag. I might do the what? I might do the married one. And yeah, infinity tag's good too. I've been drawing a lot of infinity style armor lately, so that's kind of pretty fresh in my brain. Um, uh, Brianna plus Amethyst married. Yeah, of course, Amethyst would know all about marriage and things, even though the other animals probably wouldn't. Uh, it makes you wonder where Arthur is located for Strider and Soul Age from his Strider from that transformation. Oh, yeah, good question. Because traditionally it would be in the head, but then it's got like the third level transformation. Um, probably in the body, I guess, if you like, if you were to go inside its head, like it looks like a normal combat strider from the outside but its head is not the, the cockpit fully just go through its mouth all the way down to its body or the the cockpit could move into the body i guess when it transforms speaking of soul gems based on the beneath skin pick of arthur i'm estimating something close to 50 soul gems on arthur yeah well you wanted a lot of them so there there's a lot of them um johan in the in the 70s or 20s yeah, you saw a picture of him in the 70s, like in the last page of, in a, of um, Industrial Revelations. So yeah, uh, unless you were Arthur, who really wanted to have that do not disturb option? Uh, yes. Uh, love the, the uh, DS9 Tribbles one. That was good. Oh, yes. Tribbles, can't go wrong. That's why they brought him back for like three episodes. I go with warping warm, warm, hot with worm holes you just step through in a non-euclidean fashion yeah wormholes are also a good way to explain stuff uh 
uh, it kills you and effectively photocopies your Star Trek teleporters. Yeah, that's why I don't really like them. It was cool in the original series when it's like teleportation was just as crazy as like a, a drawing tablet. <laughs> so like it's funny looking back on it now and seeing which ones actually came um, came real and what what are still kind of crazy. To know what smartphones were used for. Hmm. Uh, hair straightener. Oh, okay, right. Cook. Yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Angel. I'll do that one. There's a good video on YouTube called Imagining the Tenth Dimension. Oh, yeah, I'll listen to that next time I'm doing something. Let me just write that down. When I was at university doing my science and maths degree, I studied a, I did a course, Real and Complex Analysis, which talked a lot about billions of you know all the dimensions you can only perceive mathematically and infinity and zero and all that kind of stuff so yeah that sounds like something that would be fun explains how each dimension supposedly works okay i shall look at it all right so that's good chat has fulfilled all of my hopes and dreams so we'll do a hair straightener and um yeah i might have to change the position of arthur's eyes there because he's not going to be looking at the right direction okay so oof. Ooh, a tangent, as Dropy has warned me, is a bad thing, having lines connected together when they're not supposed to be. Um, so let's, what does a hair straightener look like? Uh, something like this. I, I did straighten my hair before, but now that I'm a grizzled old man, my hair's kind of gone a little bit straight on its own, so... So good. Swings and roundabouts, I guess. Why do you want it to do be straight? <clears throat> yeah, there's this. <laughs> and then, yep, yeah, this little plug. I suppose, I guess there's a typical outlet somewhere. Maybe it's plugged into something else. What's a brand of hair stuff? Uh, L'Oreal. <laughs> or however you spell it. I think there's a thing somewhere in there, a tilde somewhere in there, but I don't know where it is. But there we go. And yeah, I guess like frying an egg on it. I guess that would kind of work, but. This right here is what means you. What's wrong with that? That view is being teleported across the universe. Use to book. Okay, boot. Ah, you just left it as the line. There we go. That's the idea. And then, yeah, let's move the position of these eyes since he's not looking anywhere close to where he should be. Yeah. All right. <laughs> He's pretty, he's pretty swole in this one. I guess he kind of is pretty built uh, for his description, so that's all right. Uh, he can just have his um, kind of the the essence of the it's got a squirrel outfit here. Not sure when this would have happened, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That was loud. Probably peaked the mic there. That's okay. <clears throat> just a test. All right, let's do another question. Another thing. I might actually do the, the getting married one just because that was fresh in my mind. Let's go back over to some questions. So, uh, what are animals going to do for food with the shroud coming back up and blocking the sunlight? Do they still have food printers? Mm -hmm. Good question. 
So, what are they going to do for food with the shard going back up? That is a big problem. And yeah, probably like in the immediate like future, they'll probably still have like most of their like their farms and stuff would still be okay. I mean, the sunlight is still there, like coming through to some degree. And like, you know, the plants have their own, I guess, reserves of, of whatever. It might take a few days for the for the sunlight to, the, the lack of sunlight to affect them seriously. But um, yeah, that's gonna be, gonna be a big old problem. So the food, most of the, you know, the factories and things that to, to made the, the food, 3D printed all the food, probably were cannibalized for all their parts and compu computers and equipment and all that stuff. So probably very few of those work. The So yeah, that's not really an option. Uh, they could probably, like I guess, work together. I mean, one of those things that'll like bring them all together as a society to um, sort of sort things out, just their, their lack of food, or completely destroy it. Usually, I guess, historically, the um, anarchy is more likely the thing that will happen in that situation. And it's going to be everyone for themselves and whoever's stockpiling food is going to have to defend it or lose it. And everyone's going to be like hoarding everything, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the um, the actual little farms and everything, they probably are going to be functioning for a while. They'll probably have time to store a lot of their food up. But especially the, the squirrel kind of civilization has been sort of thrown into a bit of a, a bit of turmoil and destabilized and all their, their leaders are like, you know, perhaps still in hiding or whatever with all this crazy stuff that's happening. But I reckon because of the, the imminent danger of like Marvel and what might happen in the global situation, in, rather than, you know, fighting amongst themselves because there, there actually is this specific external threat that if they did deal with that, that would probably solve their problems. They could destroy the shroud again. Then they feel like they're gonna like band together and try to deal with that and hope that that works. <clears throat> um, and then they won't have to worry about finding a new food source. Or they might just hope that the kangaroos will be able to deal with it. Uh, hmm. Man. <laughs> yeah, I hate it. This doesn't look like itself when she's not colored. Um, that's. Oh, that's fine. I think she would, yeah, she'd definitely be the one in the suit, I feel like. Yeah, so in the short term, they've probably got their food, they're probably going to kind of band together and do it, like, with the food reserves they have, trying to, you know, take the world back if they can, and if that doesn't work, they can always move to the Southern Hemisphere, so that's probably something. The Southern Hemisphere is still fairly largely well it was populated more with the once the the shroud went down and they were no longer so reliant on the like the food production and the safety of the northern hemisphere more animals would have gone you know down to the southern hemisphere to to live so a lot of new infrastructure would have been built there but of course there's still kind of like strife you know, constant sort of war happening down there so i guess that would just like bring new players into that game where the yeah the warring factions down in the southern hemisphere would suddenly be assaulted by the the races from the northern hemisphere which now have been basically locked out of all their own technology and even a lot of their houses because most of the striders and things they live in have now been commandeered by marvel into like this gigantic force which you haven't really seen yet, but you'll see soon. Big force of zombies. So because of all that, they probably had little choice in order to get food. If their plans of like retaking the world don't work, they're probably just going to go down to the Southern Hemisphere, either try to integrate there or take it over, you know, based on, on their... Hmm, she kind of looks dead. I think I'll, uh, I might bring her arms like kind of more up like this. And let's see this in kind of a square angle. Mm, that's kind of a little <laughs> hard to do. But no, I shouldn't have added that. Did 
you look a little like not nervous but sort of emotional but she doesn't really do that like half lidded eye thing very much uh let's see another question <clears throat> uh since final version was a digital existence where anything was possible did most humans take on different forms via avatars if it suited them yeah they'd do that all the time so yeah basically whatever they wanted to do they would just be and just explore their various things that they wanted to do so yeah uh they probably would not be a human that much they'd probably just be whatever they'd be like a, a light or a gust of wind or a planet or whatever you know lots lots of crazy things to explore try to expand their horizons what allowed Shaw to break through apes security to gain control of the pylon does the initial flare allow one to work a much higher state of being uh yeah basically answered your own question there that is the case as soon as you get flared you like before it starts systematically deleting stuff you just have like hugely more knowledge than anything else that's why whenever they're first flared they can basically do anything take over anything that slowly goes away or pretty quickly goes away even though he was only flared by a 10 percent active one it still was enough to let him do that uh... Did flared humans ever erase their memories to re-experience moments over and over again, but also due to likely limited memory space allocated to them? Yeah, probably. That's that's also like a thing that's like a, a recurring theme in a lot of my stuff, where anything that gets like sufficiently advanced and kind of solves everything, solves all the problems of the universe, everything becomes really boring, so it'll just like delete itself and like start again. So it's sort of uh, different or you know you can just relive all these experiences again so yeah probably that definitely happened especially since final version was in operation for you know a ten thousand years or maybe more that's a long time for an incredibly intelligent being to not get bored so they probably yeah as as you said as well for memory space as well because pretty intensive even though they had like massive quantum computers working you know just just with massive amounts of storage space, it probably would still have been uh, quite a lot to to store for all those people. Not that there was like more people getting made ever and like, you know, they'd slowly sort of drop off. But yeah, that's probably a safe assumption that they would kind of delete their own um, memories quite often. Um, Mark, I think you can't be quite high up from that angle. Maybe like this. This is one of those angles that I would probably normally do like a sketch first to, to kind of get right. So it's a little wonky, but um, we'll deal with it. It's a little bit better, maybe. All right. Um, what forms of communication is used by animals now? Radio, any old forms that were popular in the rat empire? Yeah, so they actually kept a lot of their technology from the rat empire, like anything that they could. So they've got, pretty much everyone still uses the wrist communicators. So, so whatever kind of system that, that works on, which is basically radio, because the, the, the lab rats use radio waves pretty much converting radio waves converting brain waves into radio waves and then kind of they can interpret those in their own brains so they they would need sort of a radio kind of input for that to happen so yeah it's mainly based on like radio waves and they they'll still use that sort of rat network they, that doesn't take up a lot of energy so even with the shroud gone they were able to still keep that operational See now what does a wedding dress look like? I guess it's more not just radio, because it's always a uh oh well, yeah, radio waves, I guess, carrying the, the television signal or something. But the yeah, because they, they need a visual component pretty much to have their, um, you know, their full language conveyed since it's all very 
pretty visual based, the animal language, which is why they can kind of fairly easily communicate with each other. And when they're fled, they can still communicate to some extent. Uh, yes. So yeah, that was the other one. Ooh, I'm just reading these too quickly. It's, uh, <laughs> maybe I just, I just do like three lines and then go back to another one. Uh, do animals still have books or areas everything digital? Do they still use pen and paper from time to time? They, mostly it's digital. I guess they, most of them, because their lifespan's like relatively short, they probably wouldn't even, you know, know about things like paper and, th and stuff like that. But yeah, so they, they wouldn't even know that that was something that could exist probably. The, but like Amethyst and some other people who like know a bit more about human culture would probably know that the pen and paper was something you could do. And certainly like trees were pretty rare in the Northern Hemisphere. There were like those sort of black leaf tree forests, but yeah, not, not a lot growing. So nothing really to make like traditional paper out of even. But now that, you know, that the shroud went down and not everyone you know, has full access to everything digitally anymore, they probably would have sort of started to reinvent like a lot of those earlier forms of things, like probably starting off with you know, stone tablets and working up from there. So there'd probably be some, but definitely there's, there's not a lot. There'd be at least some kind of digital way to, to be doing things that they would more likely keep using. I don't, yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't, I never depicted them sort of using anything, anything like that. Let's see, how's this dress going to go over here? Uh, I'm going to go over the knees and then maybe just like running down like that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, do they still have communication um, band smartphones that were used in the old Red Empire? Uh, yes, no, they pretty much all have those still. There was like so many of those, uh, like everyone had them, like even little kids. Like Mar Marvel gets one for her first day of school. And they are, uh, yeah, so those are pretty common, pretty easy to upkeep. And because a lot of animals died in like the first stages of the shroud going down, there's even though new ones aren't really being made, there's still so many of those communicates, excuse me, communicators that they're just lying around or whatever that pass down from people, surviving family members, that there's probably never going to be a shortage of those. They kind of just keep using those. Um, what's the tech level of most armies? A mix of pre-rat empire weaponry and some rat empire weapons they managed to power. Yeah, it sort of depends. So, let's see here, uh, this goes like, yeah, the amount of sort of like stuff that they managed to have left over from the place, I guess, would have determined, you know, what happened in the initial loss of the Twilight Shroud. But pretty much everyone would have access to some kind of sort of rat technology. And, um, but yeah, the, the power is more the problem. So they're using all of the, they're mainly using them as like, I guess, residential areas to, to live in these twilight, uh, the, the, the pre shroud falling down stuff and powerful militaries are the ones that have access to the shroud pylons or a lot of the twilight shroud shards. They probably do have a lot more. So the squirrels, yeah, for example, have like a lot of striders capable of being brought into service, but they don't usually use them. But they're like the power consumption and the fact that they're not really needed for anything. They, yeah, they're, they're, they're very little that they need to actually worry about in terms of like combat and let's facing a, like a similarly powerful sort of thing. And a lot of militaries because of that, you know, the, the rat technology was built on the assumption that like there was like unlimited power basically. And since that's not the case, even a lot of powerful militaries will even just like not use them on just completely just because of the power consumption. So the bears, again, for example, if you have a look back at what they had, they had their own stuff. They had like kind of power suits and tanks and things like that, but they weren't based on sort of the, the rat design or the, the typical neural flare pattern. And so, yeah, they have 
yeah, different races have different stuff going on. And depending on yeah how far away they were from the center of the Rad Empire, I guess determines how much of that they have or how much they still rely on it. So places like you know, Central Europe, France, England, you know, Spain, all those kind of places and, and sort of North America to a lesser extent had a lot um, of that stuff around and they could sort of maintain it a lot more easily. Whereas more Northern places or more places closer to the equator, probably a bit less. And they, yeah, they wouldn't have as much of it. So they, they more have their own stuff. All right. Um, yeah. Oh, wait. Don't want to do soulless. Don't want to be like mind control coded. Yeah. I think that's all right. So let's go. Uh, another, another Joran. Um, Wolf helping the lemurs against the coming storm. I'm guessing that's the the original coming storm of like the rat stuff, or maybe like yeah. I guess there's not a lot that could be done about that. So um, hmm. Let's see now, I guess just like building up their like fortifications or maybe like working on the working on the like the upgrades to the the human machines that they've got. Uh, I think this is like fairly like stoic. I know, I know the sort of fairly big hair. And this like stuff. So yeah, I think it's probably helping them do the, the developments on the the human striders to give them flight capabilities before they realize that uh, they could just do that on their own, because of course they can. And got these kind of things on the back. I wonder if that was something that they always had or if I just put that in there in a commission, but I don't. Either way, they're there now. So yeah, I guess they'll be like overseeing. So we'll have like uh, kind of a, one of the, the Lima monitor things. So let's just add a few Lima's in here. And there'll be, little, there'll be always a little nose for Lima, but they can do that. They, they've been known to have a nose every now and then. The fancy take them. And oh, yeah, I can't put it there. It'll all around fuzz. Fuzzy ears. It looks all flat on the back of the head there. Maybe I'll do the fuzz this way. Doesn't look like a limber at all. That's just, <laughs> it's just big this up. Unacceptable. I'll have to get my act together before we. Head back to Madagascar, which will happen at some point. Uh, so it's been a while since I've been in chat, so maybe I'll just go back in there. Uh, maybe the, the lemurization will be helped by the markings, maybe not. The military coat with the high collar. Still one over here that's a bit less, a little bit less pointy. Oh, um, we also played, we were playing a a game called, I always get its name wrong, it's like Lonely Village or Lonely something, Lonely someplace, anyway, it's like a, a, a little game, little indie game, we were playing it on the Switch, and I only remembered it because it had, like, the characters in there have a very, my style of, of hair, which is like this having this sort of thing on the side of the, of the head like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like an anthro, really cute style, little chibi game, which is like one part, like Zelda puzzles, one part kind of Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley, like farming stuff, and also a bit of Animal Crossing. So you're sort of like solving puzzles in this big tower to release villages and as you release more villages they do more stuff in your town and all that kind of thing 
so yeah, just drawing that the Lima hair down there reminded me of that. So yeah, kind of a little kind of cute anthro game that's sort of okay. If to, I played it once and then kind of got a little bit over it because it, it's a little monotonous and the and the um the interface is pretty annoying to deal with just because of the way all the menus and buttons are mapped out. So it's a little bit of a struggle to do a lot of things. But it's pretty fun and very cute looking. So would would recommend for a little while. But yeah. G played it a bit longer than I did, but kind of eventually got it gets very like bogged down and grindy and like, oh, to get to this level of tower, you've gotta get 15 of these flowers to make this cake. And then to grow the flowers takes like days and all this money, and you just like <laughs> doing all this just so I can solve another puzzle to do a thing. But anyway, I liked it for a while. So it's good. I'll probably play it again, actually, until at least until I get to that point. I didn't quite get to that point. I only stopped because my eyes were bleeding and my back was broken in half because I hadn't played a game in ages and I wasn't used to that. And my whole spine. Let's get this. So yeah, we've got the Lima kind of computers, which are very sort of 1980s style. Just working out some some stuff. Let's head back in the chat real quick. What? Uh, whoop. Uh, I wonder if we'll see the wonder couple being found by our intrepid heroes and they are arguing like an old married couple, but only next time, I need no shadow Z, <laughs> next time. We are 28,000 episodes from now. Non-canon or just dumb AU where he got out earlier. Oh, is that based on? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, with Sean now a woman, well, uh, I can't stop thinking about that one weird time travel meme where one of them turns into a chick. Um, I don't know about that one. I do know the, the Rowan Atkinson little short uh, Doctor Who spoof where that kind of happens. Um, all it is cross-dressing for all we know. Yes, who knows? I'll put the next page up maybe today. Um, I've, I've got a few of them done in advance, I just never know when I'm gonna suddenly be overtaken by something that takes all my time, so I want to bring them out in a more steady stream than like all at once and then a drought. Humans, you, you run out of RAM, please install more RAM or delete data. Oh god, that means Digimon exists in our, in our shadow, kinda. Well, the RAM, they should just go talk to half the students at my school who keep stealing it out of all the computers. They've probably got enough RAM to run final version. And Digimon exist in, in our shadow? Yes. Yep. Either the original Digimon or in final version, they would have just made the digital world and someone would have been enough of a Digimon fan to actually make it all real. At least in the in the digital world. Don't know about bringing them into the real world, like Tron style, Tron 2 or something. But yeah, for sure. There's definitely Digimon in there. That is absolutely canon. So is it possible to unneural flare someone? Probably not, but um, there might be something more about that later. At the moment, no. It kind of rewrites your entire brain. I kind of missed that last part of communicating via radio since they're more visual. Mm, yeah, so they, yeah, I guess, yeah, they talked like, you know, televisual kind of communicate. I guess it'd be more like that kind of TV signal. Can the evolved animals in the Hina Shadow setting able to eat food that their unevolved ancestors weren't able to eat because it was poisonous or deadly to them, i.e. chocolate? That would probably be all the same. So there's not many dogs still around, but chocolate would still be bad for them, not that they really evolved much. But yeah, like, Brianna still pretty much just eats termites, so they most of them basically just eat whatever they would normally eat. Like, 50,000 years probably isn't... No, actually, that's probably long enough to change diets and things. It's certainly a lot easier to do that than to evolve to a considerable different state. Uh, able to eat food, they're gonna... Yeah, probably some of them. I guess if they had to, if they had to evolve to eat different stuff, or they started farming certain things, that would mean that they would have to adapt, kind of like how people adapted to drinking cow's milk, even though originally that really would have just made us throw up because that was a necessity. 
Oh, I've already... Uh, Serbeck dressed as Calypso. I've already done that. And Johan dressed as Beerus, interact with each other. Yeah, maybe. That sounds okay. I'll, I'll put that down um, as one of the things. Um, Serbeck, Calypso, Beerus. Uh, oh, Johan Beerus. Not too far off it, actually, this hairless form. Um, not having the shorter end of the stick around the knees bed and Jared being da 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 a bit peeved. Um, yeah, I'll see how we go. And that's all the questions from my list. No only chat questions remain. Oh, it is? Oh, I didn't even know. Oh, I just came to chat by completely random chance. Do you still play the Infinity game? Uh, okay, there was another... I think... Oh yeah, there was two questions. Oh, I already did that. The food one, yeah. Um, let me just write that down. Infinity, question mark. Um, mm, oh, boost. Okay, so bo we'll boosting and upgrading their defenses as much as possible. Not much we can do in the face of a newly fled Syrat. Yeah, okay, so that's that's what we're doing. Okay, cool. That's good because I hadn't done any of that yet. Um, regarding the nameless city, this was the quote I found. I shuddered oddly in some of the far corners for certain altars and stones suggested forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made and frequented such a temple. Yeah, that's like the most Lovecraftian sentence I've ever heard in my life. But yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, for the next commission, sure. Sure thing. Um, Lonesome Village. Thanks, G. That's the game. Just looked on Steam. It's cute looking. It is. That's its main thing, really. It's its cuteness of look. Uh, Arthur eats whatever. It becomes more about the pleasure of taste for him than he can convert to fuel. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so, good. Yeah, it's a sequel to my other two requests from last time, by the way. Yes, okay. I hate how often I misspell things. Yeah, well, we're only human. Whatever, this spell check these days. All right. So, yeah, I'll finish this one up. And so, about the Infinity. So, I haven't played Infinity in a really long time. This is, by the way, the, the Corvus Belly tabletop skirmish game, which is sort of set in, I guess, the not too distant future, like a couple of hundred years. I can't really remember. But it's, yeah, it's a, it's a direct continuation of our world. And I think the most interesting part about Infinity is like how they sort of expanded the world from present day to this sort of state where the, the global powers have sort of broken down and like reformed into new ones and it's all very economics driven. So yeah, like America sort of collapsed and, and a bunch of other things and the, the pan oceanic, which I, I think, patriotically I quite enjoy the yeah the pan pano which is like the main dominant power actually is formed from like Australia and New Zealand and um like a lot of the Polynesian countries and things because for some reason or, or another when the other big powers collapsed they had sort of more sway with like resources or something or their connection of trade was like the only one that was still there so the main dominant power is actually Australia and a few other places. And so they were the they were the group that I played mostly, because of course. But and yeah, the only real sort of like the the main powers that exist, you know, in present day, they kind of the only remnants of them that exist are ones who went off to another planet. I think Ariadna is the planet. And they they are like a like a lost space colony or something and so yeah, so American and, and British and French and Scottish, it's like this big mishmash of people who have a bit of a less developed technological society because it's all based on, you know, older space colonies that went to this planet that I think only recently got rediscovered. But they have a lot of cool stuff like werewolves and whatever. So they're cool. I, I dabbled in them a little bit. And the, the other guys I have, of course, are the nomads, which are like the space weirdos who just, they're all like hackers and, and they do like bio experiments and they've got weird 
tattoos and skin stuff and turn themselves into furries and do all sorts of things on their little i think satellites so they live on something but yeah i like those as well they're good they're, they're the ones i sort of transitioned to from pano when pano got a bit boring but uh, in terms of have i played the game lately not really I haven't played it in a long time i kind of just got a bit too stressed out by it and i kind of gravitated more towards games that were a bit more chill like skirmish game wise because in, in in Infinity, the thing about it is you every time you do something, like in line of sight of your opponent, you your opponent gets a chance to to do something about it, like to make a reaction. So there's a lot of really you've got to be like incredibly careful about like, yeah, if you want to go out and um, you know, shoot somebody, you've got to be you've got to know exactly where the lines of sight of all of your enemies are because as soon as you move out into line of sight of any of them all of them can suddenly shoot back at you and it becomes like this opposed test versus a bunch of people so there's like when i was playing because i would play it like fairly competitively we were fit we were like very it would take so long we'd have our little um laser sights out like looking at all the lines of fire getting out these little kind of standy pieces to like see exactly how tall they're supposed to be based on the rules not like the model height and like all these angles and everything like every movement you sort of did it and took it back because you're in line of sight of too many things and blah, blah, blah. and like it was just this big stressful thing kind of just moving everything around and being so precise about everything uh in theory it's a really cool idea to have this be the case because the you know, it just means that you don't have any real downtime. Like the main problem with a lot of games like that is that, you know, you take your turn and then when your opponent is taking their turn, you sort of switch off because there's not really anything you can do. But in Infinity, like you're always like looking and every time your opponent moves, you sort of get down to ground level behind all your models and see if any of them can shoot back. And like, it's all, like you can never really have any time to like rest and you're, and you're, it's like constantly thinking which is good in theory, but like, and I, I loved it for a really long time, but I was like, eh, I think I'll start playing a game which isn't so stressful. So I kind of moved on to other skirmish games. We played Malifaux a lot, which is really good. It's sort of like, speaking of Lovecraft, it's sort of like every 19th century Victorian trope kind of mashed into one. And so, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff, a lot of weird magic, a lot of Lovecrafty stuff, a lot of, you know, Jack the Ripper-esque sort of folklore things that have brought brought into into reality and the the way the game works is instead of dice you use a deck of cards and the suits of, of the cards and the number of the cards determine you know the different effects that happen and and how good it is and the reason why that's cool is you have a lot of like it's not completely luck based because you have like a hand of cards you can sort of choose when you want to play your like the big cards you have and because you've got your deck you know that eventually your luck's going to even out like you're going to have the exact same amount of luck as everyone because you've got the same deck of cards so yeah I, I really liked that because of the way the game worked and like it was pretty interesting and the world was fun so we played that quite a bit but um stopped for a bit and then i've been playing marvel crisis protocol i think i might have mentioned this before as well but that's another like skirmish game that's pretty cool and it's not super stressful and it's uh you can sort of you know just you got you guys are super abilities the more you get punched the more you power up and like i don't know it's a really simple system like on the surface but there's a lot of kind of tactical depth to it and matchups that are favorable and not favorable between different superheroes and yeah so i really really like that that's kind of a nice sort of chill but there's enough kind of to sink your teeth into in terms of like gameplay stuff and of course rumble slam I've been playing that a lot but yeah i still like infinity a lot for the the uh like the aesthetics and the design even though and of course angel geraldes who's like one of the best painters in the world it was always inspirational because i like painting miniatures uh of course a lot as well so i put up some of those around the place and yeah, so I like I like it in terms of its of its look and how they're painted and stuff. But yeah, actually having said that, I do feel like they kind of get a bit samey. Like there's a bunch of factions, but they're all kind of a little similar to each other. Like it's very clear they've all got the same designer 
So even though they're like vastly different forces, different countries, different levels of technology, they they all kind of look a bit the same. And then that kind of got a bit much, especially when I went to other games where things were like drastically different looking and like it was almost yeah, it was it was kind of a bit hard to sort of Infinity's very like the designs are really cool and I love how practical their technology looks and and how it sort of looks like it you know it makes sense and everything but yeah I don't know I kind of got got a bit bored of the of the aesthetic after a little while even though like a lot of the armor and things I do especially the commissions is like based on my I guess muscle memory of of a lot of the designs from Infinity but yeah I haven't played that in a little while I still got most of my models I sold some of my Ariadna stuff just because I had too many factions and I didn't enjoy playing them that much just because I was kind of like a swarm. So yeah, I, I much enjoyed more the hacking and the weird stuff in the, the Nomads faction. But yeah, I've still got them. So if someone came along and said like, oh, yeah, I'm playing Infinity, I'd probably be like, yeah, of course I do because I'll play anything anytime. So I definitely would play it again. I just haven't gone out of my way to go and do it. And yeah, I used to play with a friend a lot down the road and uh, yeah, it's good. But yeah, just a combination of like luck seeming like being a huge factor because of the D20 system and sort of the stress. Yeah, it's like it's wildly variable, like what you can roll, so you can never really know. Like it, it's simultaneously incredibly tactical, but also quite luck based. So it's like, I don't know. Um, anyway, don't want to you know, be too down about it. But yeah, I haven't really played it in a little while. All right, yeah, so let's get some bits and pieces in here. Uh, boosting and upgrading those defenses. Uh, if Theodore Shadow characters were to play Battletech, what factions would they join or create? Um, <laughs> my knowledge of Battletech is like shockingly limited, um, but I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. And looking forward to Armored Core 6, there's going to be official Armored Core 6 models that will be made. Well, speaking of Armored Core models, that's how I actually got onto the... That's how I knew that the Masterpiece Zoids would be so good, because um, before I got any of those, or before any of those came out, I got the Kodobukiya Armored Core model kits. And so I've got quite a lot of those. Um, they're just down there, actually. Uh, I need to get one. I think this guy was like the main, I don't know if that's going to focus or anything. Because um, I, I never, I played Armored Core a little bit, but I never was really good at that type of game, but I absolutely like, I loved the designs. So even though I'd only played it a little bit, I got a bunch of the um, these Kodobukiya models, which are very similarly made to the, the Zoid ones in terms of like, they're, they're quite articulate and they, have got, you know, millions of pieces. They look fantastic. They look just like the models. Huge pain in the ass to put together. I mean, therapeutic. But once they are together, they look pretty great. And I, I did a bit of painting on them to make them look a little more kind of chipped and weathered. Oops, chipped and weathered like um the, like the, the show, the show, like the, like the um game models. I think this yeah, is from Armour Core 4, I think this one. So that's kind of how long ago that was. But yeah, I played it a bit. I like the big, the big heavy guys, since I wasn't very good at flip, flipping about and doing, doing cool stuff. I just stand there and shoot. So I'm actually incredibly bad at games, unless it's like a, a strategy game, which I'm pretty good at. But yeah, I'm not very good at like <laughs> moving, moving around in a 3D space with rockets and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, I think Wolf here in this picture is just the helping them like design sort of how to do their weapon placements and stuff let's get some little guys they're in like some big sort of bunker i guess and yeah it's got some more sort of gun emplacements still with their fairly kind of 20th century level of technology because even though jrunner kind of has access to human technology. They, much like they were in the distant past, not really capable of using of um, 
using the like the well, they don't have neural flare anyway, and they yeah they just got all their stuff based on what they were left behind by their primate friends. So let's say this is all kind of a big emplacement sort of looking out, and there's some big kind of cranes bringing some bits and pieces down onto the onto stuff to shoot out across there, across the ocean of Madagascar. Um, another, oh yeah, so I was going to talk about Battletech. So I actually have a weird history with Battletech. Like I played it a little bit. I never played the video games, but I played the, like the tabletop version of Battletech and something about like the factions and the, of, of like how the Battletech lore is, it just like my brain can't retain it. Like I've looked over it a few times, but, um, I've just, I've, I sort of read the history, you know, years ago when I was in high school, I had the original box set that, where everything was still based on the Macross designs before they realized they didn't actually have the rights. All this time, I kind of assumed that they stole the, the stuff, but actually later on, I found out that, I think it was FASA at the time who was producing Battletech. Um, they, they thought, they, they'd made a deal with some company to for the rights to the designs of the Macross Mecha, but then they later realized that they only had the designs for like a very specific reason and it wasn't covered by the game, like stuff that they were using it for. But they did manage to get the the, the rights for the the reg the regal? No, the um yeah, the the Glaug, the Zentradi Commander Battle Pod, which I'm not sure what that's called in Battletech, but that one. So I really loved it like back in the day because I, I love Macross so much and I love all those designs. Once it kind of all the designs had to change, I was like, eh, not as interested. So yeah, I haven't actually played MechWarrior, Battletech, the video games at all. And I haven't played the tabletop game in a very long time, even though I kind of liked that, even though it was very methodical and uh, very slow. And all I really remember from it is you have to stand in water so you don't overheat. But uh, yeah, so that was just all for me to say that the I don't know too much about the Mechoria factions, or I once did, but like I've forgotten about it. But like it's like in a circle and like out of something, something. But anyway, that's probably it for this picture. So let's see. Uh, Arthur may be omnipotent, but that intelligence didn't come installed with wisdom, stupidity, and foolishness transcends all. Yeah, that's right. Omnipotence doesn't, well, it's just kind of like the Q situation in Star Trek. It's like, you may have ultimate power, but you can still be like a little twat about it. I'm someone who platinums, oh, shadows, dies. Uh, I think I just had a stroke. I'm someone who platinum, Sekiro, shadows, died twice. I, sorry, that's just a uh, <laughs> complete cognitive dissonance to me. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> sorry. I, I assume that's like maybe a mech warrior or a, or an armored core thing. Um, get the wanting to get the collector statue for armored core six, but Namco's website would never let me finish my purchase. Bastards! Nam Bandai Namco always doing something. I was a big big into Yu Gi Oh for a long time, and yeah, they are they're a real piece of work. They have an Infinity RPG and you can play Tag Pilots. Yeah, I have looked at that. Problem with that is I don't know, well, I guess I know some people who would play it. The bigger problem is I'm already doing like three RPs and I have no time. But yeah, the setting would be really cool for, for an RP. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll think about the Battletech one, actually. I'll look into it because I've still got the old books and then I'll come back with some knowledge of what all the In Our Shadow factions would be. Um, let's see, I think we've got time for one more thing and then one stupid thing. I'll do the Novus Rumor Johan, uh, something important one. I think that's just about the only one I haven't done. Oh, I should have done a Lonesome Village picture for the start of the stream. That's all right. If anyone's got any other questions, let me know. Um, yes, I still need to draw a dragon, that's correct. So let's go back in here. Oh yeah, that is all the questions. Um, hmm. 
let's see then. I might go delving back into some. Oh no, these are all growing suggestions. Okay, I'll more for next time. But yeah, if anyone's got anything that they want me to ramble on, or if you've got a question from the thing, Lima Mecha Dragon. All right. You like Pano from Infinity, didn't you, Matt? Yeah, I just was talking about that. Yeah, Pano is good. I like him in the in ultramarine kind of way. Um, I think Novus and or Rumor will ever meet up with Johan or any of the Immortals canonically. I don't... Oh, yeah, okay, I'll talk about that. So let me just real quick do the Nova... Nova. <laughs> the Nova and Rumus one. My Johan's coming back and talking to him. That makes sense to be doing that while <clears throat> talking about whether they would ever meet up. Um, okay, so the, I mean, the potential for that is, of course, definitely there because Johan is effectively immortal. And, okay, let's see if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll try to go a little more classic style this time. Last time I drew Novus, he didn't really look like himself because his eyes weren't 5,000 times bigger than the rest of his head. And the eyes were like this. The eyes were like really a lot. I stopped doing that pretty, not quickly, I actually kept kept it up for like a while. I think it was just into Restore Generation that they stopped having eyes that were just like a million things. I think I got this eye style from an anime called Martian Successor Nadesco. I don't, that looks really wrong. I don't, oh God. Uh, okay, I have no time for it. No time for this. Let's just do quick. quick, quick, quick. Um, yeah, Martian Success and Nadesco is like one of my favorite animes. So I'll talk about the, the Johan thing in a second. I just I, I've had a stream of consciousness um, side side tangent happen. Yeah, uh, is is an anime. It's like a parody of like most anime tropes, especially like sci-fi ones, but also other things. And I won't say too much. It's pretty old now. It came out in like. 1995 but um the yeah the the sort of it's sort of a rip on like classic okay, well, let's hit all part of this let's fix this yeah it's essentially like a sci-fi thing it, it's very it was one thing in the dub spike spencer voices the main guy akito who also does shinji and he's like a very similar um he's like a mix between shinji and like even more of like a, a harem anime type protagonist. And so he's the, he's in there and you've got your like, all your, your three female pilots with like like wildly crazy personalities and the the little kid who's like a supercomputer person and the captain who's a chick, but it's like a, like a deconstruction of all, all these tropes. And like it itself is kind of difficult to watch unless you know that it's like a parody, just like making fun of all the all this stupid stuff that happens in these things. So yeah, it's um that's really cool. Anyway, Martian Success and Nadesco was pretty cool. I liked it a lot. The designs are really good. And there's like a massive twist, which are about like they're sort of fighting these the aliens, or they call them the Jovians, they're from Jupiter. But what they actually are is like this 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 crazy twist, which is like really cool. And like it just like adds another layer to this like trope deconstruction because as they're fighting these like incredibly powerful like remote controlled alien ships they kind of like slowly realize kind of wait a minute something something's weird about this um yeah so i would recommend but anyway the eye style of that show is the same as the the uh, is where i got my eye style from when i did the uh, stolen generation so that kind of very big and like like this where the eyes would be like that and then like not connected on the bottom not that that's like typical of just that of that anime but then like kind of about three or four different types of shines in the eyes and then like a bunch of stuff kind of down the bottom so that was that's why everyone like in sg has got those eyes and then yeah so Rimna probably would be being like annoyed because she's kind of always like that. Um, 
but yeah, the, the the problem with that is like you, it's really hard to kind of tell where they're looking because uh, the the irises are so big in their eyes. So yeah, we'll just go like that. She's got the jacket. But uh, yeah, whether or not the these guys would ever meet up, so with Johan, they could do since yeah he's immortal, so he can just live through the time the timeline. And actually, his kind of goal, or the goal of sort of like what he ended up thinking was important for the world and what he was trying to do, kind of keeping it locked in a stasis of technology so nothing really advanced, so that society never progressed to a level where there was so many people that, or they were drawing so much soul energy from the universe that the universe like reset everything, speaking of that happening in the final version with the humans, that kind of, the problem kind of got taken away because between the marsupial placental war and then the war against Sapphire, the dinosaur, the, the problem kind of resolved itself because nearly everyone was dead. So there was no danger of, of people being becoming too, too populous to, uh, to, to cause any sort of problems. So yeah, that's that's probably about, so he he's not really worried about that. So he doesn't need to keep that in mind on on the daily on a daily basis. So he can kind of do it every once. Uh, what have I got? Thirteen minutes. Okay, I can draw the tree and in five minutes, and then have time to draw a terrible dragon. So yeah, he'd probably meet them just just because I'd say probably would it probably would happen. It may not happen at this point when they're kind of in their sort of young modes. Probably would happen later on, maybe even like after. It's kind of like unclear what he is even doing during all of that stuff, whether he whether he's dead or whether whatever. But he uh, he's probably around. He, oh, maybe I don't know. Sapphire might have even killed him if he was a if he was a problem. Although she didn't seem to be particularly concerned with Arena, who was also a kind of immortal mammal built by the dinosaurs. So he's probably just, and the fact that he'd been like, he'd depowered himself so much, and he was basically no longer a dinosaur. Sapphire probably wouldn't worry too much about him, like she did about Diamond, the other dinosaur, who uh, was kind of not as, or the one who was born when Sugar was born because they need like a mammal to start off their sort of weird pod process and this is going to be whatever hair johan he'd probably be just like oh hey how's it going like oh you know if they both survived this apocalypse and the dinosaur was dealt with then he'll just he'll show up and be like yeah i was here but couldn't really do anything about it so there wasn't much point getting involved so it's much like kind of professor professor he's like he uh he'd be like yeah sorry about not doing anything but we really just uh yeah the because barrett i guess being probably the second most intelligent person on the planet like at the time realized that there was no point trying to fight this not even heard with like probably the strongest person on the planet except arena and johan had like no hope at all the only way they would survive was if they subjugated themselves and became like a pet basically that would be interesting enough for a dinosaur to keep around that didn't like super work out either oh, it kind of didn't it did not work out so he's, he's just like yeah i guess he's got this little like oh it didn't leave enough room for his hand so that's okay he's got him by his sides nervous he's like got his hands on his hips And then sort of question mark. Yeah, there they go. Does he have this? Probably. He has it now. Okay, so I've got five, 10 minutes for a dragon. One last bit in the chat and then Lima dragon time. Uh, Lima mecha dragon. That also sounds like a Yu-Gi-Oh card. I think Nova and Orima will ever... Oh, we just did that. Canonically, probably not. Their stories are pretty much done. Also, what year did SG and RG take place again? SG took place in 2003, RG took place in 2020. 
If Arthur did solve all the problems with time travel, he'd probably demonstrate it by going back in time to punch himself in the face for stealing his water bottle and steal the same water bottle. Mmm, the water bottle paradox. Sog puppet Sanji. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, Sanji is a character from the third series of the Wings of Fire dragon novels. And I think Zitali is saying sock puppet because I thought that your drawing of a dragon you were doing from the front looked a bit like a sock puppet. Why is that all had like Kermit energy or something? So yeah, I think I'll put a sock in that one and do that one next time uh, for sure. I'll do the Lima dragon. Maybe I'll have time for both. We'll find out. Turn that off. Turn that on. Uh, what the hell would a, what the heck would a Lima dragon look like? I mean, it's a mecha. So it's a mecha that the lemurs would make that is a dragon. So their stuff is kind of like fairly angular, like this kind of thing. Its head would probably be, oh, this is like a zoid already. <laughs> yeah, okay, it would look like, like one of the early zoids probably, like a, a redla or a Godos or something like that. Yeah, they kind of, yeah, they sort of come out a little bit, yeah, like that, that, oh no, not the Zoids, but like the Lima stuff. And they've kind of got this sort of bit business, which doesn't really make sense for a dragon, so we'll probably get rid of that. And yeah, I'd probably just be like a whole bunch of, this is great, I've had two like mecha dragons in a row, so I can actually not be completely terrible about it. Is that something? <laughs> Somehow it's looking even more like a Zoid than the Zoid dragon that I did last time. So that's fine. So let's see what sort of pose we're going to go with here. I think it's going to be like a flying, so it's doing this sort of rearing up kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, got some arms. Now, the Lima stuff has a lot of, pan a lot of this kind of shapes. So that's going to be an arm. I guess I'll have like a shoulder kind of coming around like that. And it would have big booster rockets as part of its flight capabilities. Sorry I've been sniffing this whole time. It's been a little under the weather. Sorry about drawing a terrible coffin looking thing. That looks better. No, no, they don't have that. That's a rat thing. They have more of a this kind of hexagonal uh, ramjet kind of looking thing, and then like that, and then this, so this is like a heart kind of, like near, near the body, but like attached like as a backpack that the wings kind of will come from, and a little, little sort of air outlet down here, and a little this bit, Another one on the other side. And probably need some horns, I reckon. Oh, Lehman's also pretty metal, so they have like, they have like pretty like big horns, but uh, something. Yeah, they probably just like aesthetically just put a bunch of crap on here just to make it look a bit more cooler. And then, yeah, the arms, got some like, gonna make sure everything stays very angular and has a lot of just actual round pistony thingies, not pistons, like hinges. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, and then the body's coming, coming out like this. Now, I guess, Angular, but also maybe they would have modeled it a little bit on the kind of the human design. Bring that around, do this. Make sure I'm not being too, um, yeah, without it looking too much like a Zoid. I feel like they would have this as well, but it have those kind of roundy loop things. And yeah, probably maybe even like separate it out a little bit from here. 
And then... <clears throat> yeah, so the wings would just be like... Big metal bits with sort of like this kind of joining in between them. Getting so hooked up on like a little, the little bits, I'm not looking at the big picture. Whoops. I really might be looking at the big picture if I throw the whole canvas away. Whoop. Okay, so that's going to come down here, but I better draw this other arm first. So we've got kind of this shoulder bit and the arm inside. Four minutes. Bit of an awkward pose, but draw that. Learning to fly. Yeah. In there. And oh, I think we have probably big guns. Yeah, guns on the back. Oh, big cannons. Uh, rail guns. Yes. On the inside. Yeah, on the inside. And then the rest of that booster, and then this bit, and this bit. Sorry, I've stopped talking about anything. I'm just, <laughs> just, just either talking about what I'm doing. Um, do we have? I uh, recently realized the dragon I see that I've never that I've never had drawn was similar to Sapphire in a way. A reborn. Creator who is given a way to see evil and corruption and to destroy it, but evil isn't everything yet. Yeah? Uh, the balance of the force or something. Um, yes. So let's just finish this up real quick. Might actually finish on time this time. But yeah, I guess the old kind of dinosaurs, ancient beings, something, something, powers. Um, ever since kind of Get a Robo, that's kind of been a thing. So yeah, I like to put dinosaurs and stuff. They're a pretty cool thing to just have be a, an ancient thing, but it's also sort of kind of grounded in reality. And maybe they did could do all that stuff. Who knows? Prove to me they didn't have teleporters and time travel. Oh, you found every fossil record of everything they ever made? No, I didn't think so. So yeah, they're a pretty cool little like thing. Well, so. Yeah, as again, I think before I might have mentioned Sapphire herself was based on a character that I had, a fan character that I had for a game called Biomotor Unitron, which I never played, which was on the Neo Geo Pocket, which is a system I never had. But I saw some pictures in a, like, a magazine, like a gaming magazine, and there was like two screenshots from this game. And the, one of them was like this kind of lizard looking person. I was like, huh. So then I just built like a whole fan character based on this one screenshot. And that eventually became Sapphire. They were called Crystal for a long time, but that was a little too generic. And yes, so we've got one minute to go. And I think that's probably all of the dragon I'll do. I feel like that's not the worst. Then again, that's an incredibly low bar. So that's something. A little more body here, but yes, yeah, certainly uh, Sunju Sock Puppet. Oh, here's a preview. Uh, uh, <laughs> never mind, no preview today. I forgot what a leaf wing looks like. So, yes. Thank you so much for everybody for being here on this stream. Um, I'm glad that the sound sort of managed to be a little bit less terrible than before. And yeah, I appreciate so much everyone hanging around, asking questions, giving me suggestions. Hopefully it's been all right and you got some little more insight into the little old comic worlds of, of me and um, some, some other bits and bobs along the way. And yeah, I'll probably stream again in another couple of weeks. And yeah, so if you wanted to think about some other stuff to, to ask or request in between now and then, just do that. Yeah, so maybe like, maybe every three weeks or maybe two or three, depends how I'm going. Certainly when I sort of quit teaching in about eight weeks time, I will have a bit more time to be doing streams and things like that. And that's when things are gonna start getting crazy in terms of having to make money other ways and seeing if I can actually do it or not. 
but I'll annihilate that bridge when I come to it, as Master Shake once said. And thanks again for joining me, and um, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.